Five years ago, I would have woken up this morning, rolled out of bed, gotten on my hamster wheel, and I would have rushed off. I knew I had a community event in Lebanon today, and I'd been scrambling to get everything done or washing some dishes or whatever. But this morning, I opened my eyes and I heard the rain, and I thought, okay, praise God, it's raining. And I heard it. I went out and let my dogs out. We sat on the porch and I drank some coffee. And I listen and I smell and I hear the rain. That's Gina's light. And that's what I hope I can share with you today. I am blessed to be Gina Renee Hall's sister. So happy birthday, sis. The Miraculous Journey. A day made in heaven. Love is never glad about injustice, but rejoices whenever truth wins out. Chapter 1. After all. We would be back one day to tell the truth. It has always been about two hearts connected forever. It has been 38 years since I last saw the smiling face of my sister, Gina Renee Hall. Forged in my mind forever in the very <coughs> last image of her dainty ankle crossing the threshold as she left, adorned with a bracelet, two gold interlocked hearts. Our sisterly bond was strong because we had shared a challenging childhood together, during which time we had each provided what the other seemed to need most. Gina's gentle, humble ways brought balance to my strength and strong will. Her heart ruled her head and my head ruled my heart. My sister's last words as she walked out the door, listen to your heart, not your head, have reverberated through me since the day that she was murdered at age 18. On June 28, 1980, Gina said those words to me as she left to go out for a summer evening. She would never come home again, and neither did her body. My family did not have Gina's bodily remains to lay to rest so we could peacefully mourn. Without knowing the whole truth surrounding her death, we had no closure. We went through the motions of having a funeral, remembering all that was good about my sister. But it was a funeral without a body, a headstone with an empty grave. For a long time, I thought I was at peace with never having found her body. I told myself it was just a body, somewhere in the cold ground, not her soul. Through the years, I have felt her with me during my milestones, but always with the sobering reality that she was not physically here with me. All this time, I hated the man who robbed her of her life. I could never forgive. My heart was heavy laden, always trying not to remember, but never forgetting. Despite the unforgiveness buried in my heart, I still lived a fulfilling life. I always knew that was exactly what Gina would want me to do. If her life could be summed up in a message to share with others, it would have been this. Simply embrace all of life's everyday wonders because we do not know which day will be our last. True, but there was more. <clears throat> This book is a, a compilation of miracles, it really is. And as I share with you today, I would like to just share the excerpts that I think some 500 pages up, best I can. And I thank you for coming. So the plan will be to, to share these excerpts with you and then to have some Q&A. So if I don't answer a question during what I share, have a question ready for me. Give me some practice. Because I'm sure I'm going to get it. 
But this book is an extraordinary experience. It is 500 pages, all written because I captured one picture and received one necklace. Or this story would not have been written. So in my humble opinion, because I experienced a very humbling experience that I consider a divine plan, then God must have had a plan all along. So this true story is written from the mindset that I was in as I experienced it, not the mindset that I find myself in now. And that's important to understand as you read. So I hope that the book takes you on the same stepping stones that I journeyed. In June 29th this year, I threw a little <coughs> candlelight dance for Gina. We could call it a vigil, but we danced. And behind us, this picture was captured. That's what I want to talk about today. Gina's light, the light of her life. There are no coincidences in this journey, and that is a truth that I learned during the journey. And I imagine that the day that Gina's life was taken, God already knew we'd be standing right here today. He knew. He already knew that he would take that bad and he would turn it into good. So Gina's life, her human life, was taken from us. But her light shines on forever. There are no coincidences that that showed up. Right here. Where this was taken. Miracles. So we danced. We had a wonderful event and honored my sister. And where this was held was actually a place where in 1980 this happened. Sunday, July 20th, the day after Gina's bloody clothes were found, approximately 70 uniformed officers, some carrying shovels, some poles, shoulder to shoulder, searched this area. It was a sweltering hot day, three long weeks since Gina went missing. By then, the publicity around the case had heightened. When I was experiencing the journey, I went back through Gina's letters. And those are the words written to me two months before she passed. Love, it is never glad about injustice, but rejoices when truth wins out. So, I would like to regress back to what I call the composed story. The composed story is what won the case. We were blessed to have a story to build off of and the evidence and put him away and everything worked out as it should have. But what we, what we got to understand is to go back to the mindset that won that war, the composed story. So I'm pretty big on sharing that as much as I can. Page 53. Will you help me clasp my necklace? She asked, her hazel eyes dancing with excitement, eager to be dancing within the hour, smiling delightfully at the prospects of seeing her friends. That was Gina. When Gina smiled, her high cheekbones would be so stunningly pronounced that I always wondered why I did not get some of those jeans. I jokingly accused her when we were little of sucking on too many jawbreakers. As I pulled her shoulder-length hair up so I could clasp her necklace, I noticed it fell perfectly back in place. Gina's shiny, healthy hair would bounce with every step she took. Her hair was naturally thick, and her hot curlers would set the feathered, wavy layers in perfect harmony so no wind could blow them out of place. Even when she hadn't styled it, 
Her hair framed her face with little swirls. In the townhouse was a small landing so that when you came in the front door, you could either go up the steps to the bedroom or down a few steps into the living room. I walked her to the steps of the landing, noticing how put together she was, dressy white pants riding high up on her waist, specifically chosen to camouflage her deep scars, hugging only her ankles where she had cut slits to tailor to her petite stature and her purple bodysuit matching the straps on her shoes. This night she wore a white Wrangler jacket that we shared, her sleeves neatly rolled up highlighting her bronzed hand she had worked on earlier in the day, sunbathing while napping in the privacy of her backyard after a hard few days of exams. And even though it was summer, she would never have taken the jacket off, always conscious of her scarring. As she left, I plunked down on the living room floor, glum about my angry boyfriend, locked away in my bedroom upstairs. <clears throat> Just as fast as Jean had gone out the door, she came running back in and bound up the stairs. I can't go out dancing without my ankle bracelet. That ankle bracelet would become a part of the murder scene, evidence used later in the trial. That ankle bracelet would be found in the shag carpet at the bottom of the spiral steps in the lake house, broken from her struggle to break free from her captor, or captors. When Gina descended the stairs, she stopped on the landing, tapping her feet excitedly, spinning around to tell me goodbye again. As she looked down, she saw my tears, and I had held the big ones back as long as I could. I looked up better through the my watery eyes, and there she stood, beautiful as ever, the delicate gold chain on her dainty ankle. We both had the same designed bracelets, two hearts interlocked, symbolic of our sisterly bond. Then she gave me those last words of sisterly advice. Listen to your heart, not your head. Delaney, you always think too much. Just follow your heart and you'll know what you should do. Heart, not head. And then Gina left driving away to <coughs> Monte Carlo. I climbed the stairs to her bedroom, watched some TV, and cried myself to sleep, wallowing in self-pity. So those letters that she sent me in 1980, March, are prophetic. Because this is what she said. Love, it is never glad about injustice, but rejoices when truth wins out. All the special gifts and powers from God will someday come to an end, but love goes on forever. I love you and hope one day we can live up to that paragraph above. Gina. Amazing. So on my website, themiraculousjourney.com, I try to sum up the journey in one sentence what my web guy told me to do. And this was it. The rainbow of emotions that I experienced during the journey can be summarized with one peaceful thought. Finally, my sister's voice will be heard. Truth, love, and forgiveness sets the heart free. So what's about that composed story? For decades, I just really could never forgive him. I carried that heaviness in my heart, that anger, that hate. But I was in peace because I always knew my sister was in heaven. Always. I never questioned where she was. But it didn't keep me from becoming angry that they degraded my sister's honor. The composed story was not what happened. And I never could let that go either. And what has surfaced again? The same old composed story. And that would be this story. The composed story my sister portrays as willingly leaving this <coughs> popular dance spot to be with Everly. That is the story they tell. The story of a teenage girl who left with a man, a man she would have just met, a man ten years older than she was, Everly, as if this was a normal, accepted Saturday night practice. 
I call this the wolf pack mindset of bonding together, working together, hunting together like a pack, taking down their prey. But the ultimate objective was actually the opposite of a single wolf's true nature. Wolves mate for life. Wolf pack seems an appropriate name for the writers of the composed story. Time for the truth about the last moments of my sister's life. <coughs> Composed, happy, and willing to go story had begun. I always knew beyond a shadow of any doubt that Gina did not meet a man in a bar and leave to be with him, as the wolf pack composed the story. They took a girl who was untarnished, which became the first mistake in their composed story. Gina was a lamb, pure innocence and goodness through and through. Gina did not have a promiscuous bone in her body. She was loved by many who also knew the composed story was a lie. And those who knew came together that summer of 1980 and put forth a remarkable effort. That was Gina's goodness exuding from others in their caring actions. The composed story carried forward while many facts were ignored. What I never knew was the rest of the story. Composed story prevailed. The lake house became a cabin. The upscale disco dancing place became a bar, a nightclub, and Gina went with him willingly. It is time to tell another story, sister story of two interlocked hearts stronger together forever. By December of 1980, the burden of proof was met, and Gina's murderer received a life sentence, but with parole every one to three years. As noted in Chapter 4, an obvious comparison of Pepperly's headshots. One of my favorite discoveries while writing this book was when I really looked at his pictures, his arrogant confidence going into the trial. He's starting to question in the middle of the trial, and then he's handcuffed and taken out. And that is a look of what the heck just happened. They didn't have a body. How did that happen? Justice prevailed. We might even ask how. Gina's light and John Hall. That was my sister in her honor. She didn't spend the night with men. Her honor was so easily dismissed. The composed story continued to be the story, and it had been so ever since 1980. Their story, not ours. Not my sister's story. Yet it did not change the hearts of those who knew and loved Gina, the people who cared, who knew her, and came to know her. The law enforcement officers that showed up on their days off. Everett Shockley, a young, hungry prosecuting attorney who still believed in right and good. Strangers that came to the woods because our citizens of Coburn put together a $10,000 reward and brought people to those woods. Gina's light exuded in the summer of 1980 and brought these people together. A community's caring efforts, the dedicated serving people, and everyone's love of Gina, knowing of her genuine innocence, kept the momentum progressing. And that was exactly how and why Eberly came to be arrested, tried, and successfully convicted. My family is forever grateful for all the local people and the authorities who helped, those who served, those who were not a part of the few, the interconnected web of influencers, elusively seeking to hide truth, compromising the principles of the caring, respectful majority of those good people living in that small town community.